Good evening, everybody. Thanks for sharing some time this evening uh, as we meet and uh, talk with a couple of authors in another one of the INL US's Authors Corners. I'd like to introduce our two guests today. The first is Amy Hendrickson, affectionately known as Mrs. Ms. Henpen. Uh, Ms. Hen has been writing children's and nonfiction books since about 2011, when she began to attend the Iowa Writers' Summer Festival. Two of her books kind of caught my attention, one of the ones that we're going to talk about today, but another one, they both really seem to have a strong female empowerment perspective, which I suspect she'll talk about tonight. She lives in Western Michigan and embraces her own Scandinavian heritage while living among Dutch in the communities that surround her. She's got two grown children, three grandchildren, and of course, two kitty cats, which you may see walking behind her from time to time. We've seen them already. Um, and she's here to talk about her book called Laura of the North. Welcome, Amy. And then we also have Eric Newman. Eric is our other author tonight, and he comes to us from Cincinnati, Ohio. Eric's taken numerous trips to Iceland, exploring the country with his children, and has some great tips and resources on his Icelandic with Kids website. He's now the proud father of five kids. But since the family was unable to travel to Iceland in 2020 due to COVID, he decided that a book geared towards children about puffins would be the thing to create and publish this year. So that kind of wet his appetite for Iceland. Um, already that book has won the silver medal for children's picture books, children's picture eBooks at the 2020 Moonbeam Festival. So I look forward to hearing from Eric, author of Lundi the Lost Puffin, The Child Heroes of Iceland. I'd like to turn the time over to Amy first and we'll give each of the authors, um, you know, five minutes to talk about themselves and the books that they've created. Uh, before I do that, I want to also say that we welcome all of your audience questions. Down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Anytime a question comes to your mind, type it in there, and I will kind of monitor that box. And towards the end of our conversation with uh, Amy and Eric, we'll pull some of those questions forward and ask them. So don't be shy about asking questions. Um, so first of all, Amy, can you tell us a little bit about your book and what maybe inspired you to write it? Well, I, I love to travel. I've been um, to quite a few places, but um, in 2016, I went on an extended cruise and um, went to Iceland. And it had been a goal of mine to get there. So that was really great. And um, there I went to uh, the Tingvillir and I saw where they had all of the um, law proceedings of the of the whole country. They would get together with the chieftains and it was like quite a festival um, atmosphere where the big crevices in the, in the um, earth. And I, I was just fascinated with the whole thing. But the thing that struck me the most was um, the drowning pool where the women, the men, men were hanged at Gallows Rock or, um, or they were beheaded, but women were drowned. And um, it just captured my imagination because they had a, a plaque with the years and the actual names of the women who were drowned in the drowning pool. So I took a picture of it and it just stuck with me. And I thought, gosh, people should know about this. This is so interesting. Later, I learned that other countries, Scandinavian countries also have things um, very similar to what um, Iceland had. And, um, so I then in 2017, I was able to go with a friend to Norway um, and actually the area where um, he was working was where my great great grandfather came from, Xi'an. So I, I was able to do a lot of um, touring around there. I found the place where they um, worked the bogs and, and made bog iron. And, um, and uh, Henrik Ibsen is also from Xi'an and turns out um, they were baptized, my great-great-grandpa and um, Henrik Ibsen were baptized 
at the same time in the same church. And um, I met with the librarian in Xi'an and he helped me find a bunch of genealogy information about the family. And I learned quite a bit about that. So I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I had a strong female character who could get from Iceland to Norway, I could kind of incorporate both of those narratives, but how would I get her there? If she had to escape Iceland for some reason, and she does, but I'm not gonna tell you why. So um, while I was thinking about that in 2018, I found that there is a um, small cruise line that goes from Denmark to the Faroe Islands to the Eastern side of Iceland and back again. And I thought, now there's a way that it would work if she was somehow rescued and brought to the Faroe Islands and then from the Faroe Islands went to Norway. So I um, incorporated what I learned at the, in the Faroe Islands also. And so that's where Laura goes. She goes from Iceland to Faroe Islands to Norway and back to Iceland, which is a familiar theme in a lot of stories. We call it home, away, and home. Very nice. I kind of really need to read this book because my got my interest quite piqued. I got to find out what. Why did she leave? What brought her back? Oh, <laughs> we'll get it out of you before the hour's up. Okay, Eric. Let's hear from you about your book and uh, share share with us your inspiration. Yeah. Hi, David, and thanks so much for organizing this. Um, as you mentioned, you know, I guess my inspiration was th that I couldn't travel this summer. That um, I was hoping to spend some time in Iceland, being a a, a tour guide or planning people's trips, uh, and obviously that wasn't going to happen. And so I had this story um, that I'd heard um, years ago in Iceland that I just loved about how their children on the Westman Islands um, who rescue thousands of baby pufflings every fall. Um, and I knew I wanted to, to talk about it. I didn't know how I had it on my website. I had it in my book, but um, this gave me an opportunity to, to, to really um, be telling this story um, by itself, giving it the, the attention that, that, that it really needs for you to understand this story. Um, I guess to take a step back a little bit, I was lucky enough to spend the summer of 2016 with my family in Iceland. When I say my family, I mentioned I have five kids. The youngest of those kids at the time was three months old. Um, in 2016. So actually, Amy, maybe you and I were in Iceland at the same time. You might your, have been. <laughs> your 2016 cruise. Um, and so we had been to Iceland uh, in 2009. And if you think it's hard to go with five kids, one of whom is, 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 is three months old. Um, in 2009, I was on crutches. Didn't happen in Iceland, happened at home, but I was on crutches and my wife was pregnant. So we didn't venture much past Reykjavik. We saw the Golden Circle, we saw Reykjavik. And so when the opportunity came for me to, I still had to work, but to, to work um, from a, a different place in 2016, we said, let's go back to Iceland. Let's see all of those things we didn't see. Um, toured around Iceland, loved it, realized that it's such a wonderful family-friendly place. Um, I started the website, icelandwithkids.com, which, you know, I got some views, but I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. I came back and I had a, a full-time job still. Um, but a couple of years ago, um, in 2018, my partners and I um, closed down our company and I said, well, now it's time for me to actually actually work on this book and, and get this book out. So I wrote my first book, um, which is Iceland with Kids, um, which is a detailed planning guide to planning, planning your, your Iceland trip, um, mostly from the US, but really from anywhere. And um, I went back with just two kids um, last summer in 2019. Uh, I updated the book. I saw some things we hadn't seen, seen before. And then this is the, the second edition. You know, this is sort of my, my labor of love, right? This is, you know, 100,000 plus words and maps and pictures and just lots and lots of details to help people plan, plan the trip. A lot of it is work I was going to do anyway, right? I, I'm a planner, right? I want to know if my cell phone's going to work and what kind of power adapters I need and what I should see and what I shouldn't see and what I can do with kids my age. And so uh, this year in 2020, so this came out, it's probably the worst possible timing of any book in history is that I published this in February of 2020, the second edition of it, right? And just at the tail end when things were still looking normal in the world. Um, and I, Put it out there that I could help you plan your trip. People had asked me, hey, can you, your book is great, but there's still too much. Can you plan my trip for me? And I'd always said, no. I decided 2020 was going to be the year I was going to say yes. So I got a couple of paying clients. I planned their trips. 
And then one by one, those emails came through, eh, why don't you hold off? My, my trip is probably canceled. And so I realized that my idea of maybe being a tour guide in Iceland, at least planning people's trips and visiting wasn't going to happen. And it had this story in my head um, that I mentioned of, you know, the kids rescuing these pufflings. I love that word, pufflings, the baby puffins in Iceland. Um, I realized how family friendly Iceland was um, just by being there on crutches and or with five children, you know, that's, uh, they drive on the same side of the road as we do in, in the US. Um, people speak English throughout, it's safe, it's amazing. It's just the, the perfect combination, I think, for visiting with your family. And one of the places I really loved was the Westman Islands. And so many of you may know this, but this is an archipelago, an island chain off of the south coast of Iceland. Uh, only one of those islands has any inhabitants. It's, it's the, the, the town of, of, of Hema'e, has about 4,500 people. And I love it for so many reasons. One is that there's a ferry ride, which is great. It's about a 35 minute ride, which I think is perfect with kids. If you're not on the ferry to the Faroe Islands or Denmark for 25 hours or however long that ferry ride is, it's 35 minutes and you're in this different place, but you're not stuck on the boat for hours and hours. I love it because there was a volcano that erupted there in 1973 that buried houses and changed the landscape. And that's living history. You'll find people, you'll run into people who were there when this volcano erupted. It was less than 50 years ago. And I love it because of the story where children rescue these pufflings. Um, you know, the, the, I'll give the abbreviated version of the story that, that, that which is in my book, Lundi the Lost Puffin. And that is that these pufflings are born and raised in a burrow, sort of safe and snug on the side of a cliff. Um, their parents feed them fish for 45 days or so, and then they're on their own. Uh, sometimes the parents leave first and the poor puffling is all by himself and hungry and needing to find the ocean to get fish. Sometimes the puffling thinks he's old enough to go and, and leave first, um, but eventually he's on his own. And uh, so under, under the cover of night, they have an instinct to go and fly toward the ocean. That's where the other puffins are. That's where the fish are. Those puffins can teach them how to fish. and. Um, their instinct is to fly toward light, right? So there's a cliff behind them that's dark. There's hopefully the moon in front of them that's light. So they fly toward the moon. That's not a cliff, that's the ocean. Many times they are confused by, by the, the, the lights of town, by the lights of Hema'e, and they end up in town. Once they're in town, they're in trouble. And so there's a tradition, a cultural tradition for hundreds of years, if not longer, that children go out, this happens starts maybe late August, with cardboard boxes, flashlights, and something to hopefully nudge those pufflings in, in, into a cardboard box, keep them overnight and then in the morning take them to, to the sea life trust the aquarium in town where they're weighed and if they're healthy enough they throw them back into the ocean i just love this and i loved it more when i heard that in the fall of 2019 um, the children of the Westman Islands of Hema'e rescued 7672 pufflings so this is not just some little fly by night i guess would be a bad joke <laughs> some little fly by night operation <laughs> that's exactly what it is um, you know this is a major part of the culture there where kids get to stay up late in the fall, rescuing these pufflings and thousands and thousands of them are, are saved every year. And so I knew I, knew I wanted to, to tell the story and this quarantine, well, it's bad that I couldn't go to Iceland. It gave me the opportunity to really write this story and sort of shine a light on this amazing part of the history in the Westman Islands. Thank you, Eric. Um, you know, many of us that are affiliated with the INL US um, have Iceland is our part, part of our personal heritage, and I assume neither of you are Icelandic in any part. So I'm kind of curious, what is it that draws people to Iceland that don't have that natural affinity by ancestry? Is there something special about Iceland that's a magnet for you two? Amy? Well, um, I when I was in Norway the first time, wasn't this trip when I went to discover about my family. But when I was in Norway the first time, I learned that so many of the Irish people or the, the um, Norwegian people settled in Ireland and Iceland. So a lot of the those cultures are very similar to Norway's. And that's what kind of got me interested in Iceland. Plus, I just think there's so many cool geographical um, areas in Iceland that you can see in a small amount of time, you know, with the volcanoes and the geysers and the uh, glaciers. And yeah, we rode little horses, little Icelandic horses while we were there. It was great. It's a, it's a great place to visit. I agree with Eric there. Nice. Mm -hmm. Eric, do you have a, uh, something that really draws you there? Yeah. Emotionally and I or? 
Yeah, I'll be honest that my first trip was really just based on, on, on it being practical. You know, we went in 2009 after the economic crisis when the Icelandic currency had weakened dramatically. So when Iceland was on sale, I, I sort of joke with people. And also, you know, living on, on the East Coast at the, at, the, at the time we lived in, in, in Philadelphia, it was a faster flight to Iceland than it was to California, right? And so for me, and they, they drive on the right side of the road. And for me, just the first time I visited, it was just, let's go somewhere with, with our kids. But during that trip, all of the things we saw and what Amy mentioned, that world-class attractions and waterfalls and, you know, continental rifts and volcanoes and things that are, and many of those things, you know, visible from the main road, from Ring Road, right? And so we realized that there was a rich cultural her heritage there and so many amazing stories, my, my Puff and Link story, but so many other stories as well um, that really just sucked me in and meant it, it was a place that we wanted to spend, you know, after we spent a week there, we wanted to spend 12 weeks when we had the opportunity. So rich culture and amazing sites. And I tell people, I think it's a perfect combination of safe and amazing right there. You'll see on Instagram, some amazing pictures from all over the world. They don't tell you that, you know, they were afraid of getting robbed in, in the taxi or not in Iceland, other countries. They don't tell you how they got a three hour hike to get there. Um, Iceland has that same amazingness, that same awesomeness, that awesome natural beauty in a package that I think is very accessible and safe and safest country in the world, as far, as far as I can tell, combined with probably the most amazing country in the world. And I think that's a really rare combination. And obviously to be number one or high on both of those lists, it's the perfect combination I think of safe and amazing. And I realized that after I'd been there. That's really great. It's nice to kind of hear what, what inspires you and motivates you to write these books. I'd like to spend some time diving into each of the books a little bit. Um, so Amy, I understand that Laura, La La is how we'd say it in Icelandic, mm -hmm. um, is set in like the early 1700s as a kind of a starting point. Why, yeah. would, you choose, why would you choose that point? And what challenges did you face like learning about that period of time in Iceland and Faroe Islands and Norway? I, um, I read a lot of books. In fact, I went up in the attic and brought down, I have a whole bin of research materials. I got kind of lost in the research. It was so interesting. And um, I, I kind of love that part of it. But um, I decided to do, it takes place from 1705 to 1708. And what's interesting about it is that um, especially for this time in history, is that I chose that time because that was when the worldwide pandemic of smallpox happened. And it decimated whole communities all over the world. And I thought that that was a, a, a really important thing for people to know about a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic. Um, and uh, so I incorporated that in with the story. It also was a year that there were um, two drownings at the, in the drowning pool in 1705. So that gave me a starting point for her in Iceland. And then um, going to the Faroe Islands, she actually um, is affected. And I'm not gonna tell you what happens to her, but she's affected by, um, the smallpox pandemic when they are in Bergen, Norway. And then she makes her way back to the Faroe Islands, which also the Faroe Islands lost three quarters of their population during that pandemic. Wow. So it's kind of timely. I didn't realize it when I was writing the book, but it's kind of timely that we now are in the midst of another worldwide pandemic. Yeah. I, I think if I'm not mistaken, Laura is a young teenage girl. She's 15 at the beginning of the story. Okay, yeah. so would you say that your book is um, something that would appeal to teenage women? I would say young adult, but most of the people who have um, told me that they've read it are adults. One of the things that, that appeals to people about it, I used to be a um, school librarian and so um, one of the things that about a young adult book that appeals to kids is short chapters and each chapter has a little bit of a cliffhanger. So you wanna keep reading. Um, and that actually appeals to adults too. So um, it's got a lot of chapters, but each chapter leads you on so that you can't really go to bed yet. You have to read more. 
<laughs> I, love, I love short chapters too. That's a great book. Short chapters. <laughs> My attention span sometimes is kind yes, of. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're, yeah. Eric, tell us a little bit about the story of Lundi. And I, I particularly want you to draw out some of the really cool scientific stuff. Aside from the story, the back couple of pages have some really great biology stuff going on. Yeah, I, I really wanted to make this as accurate as possible, given given it's narrated by, by a, a, a puffin, right? So it's obviously not 100% accurate, but I wanted to make it as accurate as I could. So that the, the landscapes you see are from Iceland, mostly from the Westman Islands. I think my illustrator snuck in a picture of Vik just because he liked it so much. Um, I wanted to capture what the puffling actually looks like at every stage of life. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we can jump to that. Actually, I think I don't have this up, but I can I think what you mean is sort of this. Mm -hmm. um, where I kind of show, and actually I have better illustrations here. One of the things that I realized when researching this is that the, the puffling looks different. The puffling looks different at each stage of life. When it's born, it's this sort of cute fuzzy chick, um, you know, sort of nice and, and furry and fuzzy and cuddly. Um, and what we picture as puffins, and let me actually see if I can share my screen here. Um, this is actually a, a page from the book. And hopefully you guys can see now. Um, this is sort of the classic look of, of a puffin has noticed the orange beak and those orange feet. And everybody thinks, oh, this is what a, a puffin looks like when it's grown up. Well, that's true. This is what it looks like when it's grown up, but it turns out it doesn't get the orange till it's maybe three or four years old. Until then there's this sort of middle stage, the adolescent stage, if you will. Um, and here you can see on the right-hand side, um, he doesn't have orange feet and orange beak, right? It, it's sort of grayed out, it's gray. A uh, little hint of orange coming in there, but I wanted to make sure that I was accurate. And in fact, I had to go back to my illustrator a couple of times and say, oh, I forgot his feet shouldn't be orange here. His feet should be gray. Um, this page as well, I wanted to make accurate. So this is, I actually got uh, got uh, uh, permission from the Sea Life Trust, which is the aquarium where the the, the, the pufflings are brought and weighed. Um, I got, I, they, they allowed me to, to use the, their logo in the book you can see there. And that's actually, you know, the picture on the right is based on a real image um, of of the Sea Life Trust, where they they put the puffling end and weigh him and make sure he's he's healthy enough. And so, something that I didn't really realize um, is the, the puffling just sort of look different at different stages of life. It makes total sense, but you kind of picture the, the stuffed animal puffling with the orange beak, and that actually they don't get there till so, so, to, to, till till they're they're several years old. Um, I wanted to also make sure I captured the, the beauty of Iceland. This is sort of one of my favorite you know, pages, spreads from the book. It's actually, you can see the, the line down the middle. This is, this is two, two pages of my book. Um, and you guys are seeing these pages, right? I'm not just talking to <laughs> craziness. Um, yeah, th this is just an example. Mom and dad took turns catching fish for me. You know, I, I read so many people who had done research and said, you know, that, that it really is true that they eat up to, up to, to, to 10 meals per day. That's a true fact. I read several thousand fish and what I realized, I was just sort of thinking about how do I tell this story? You know, I've seen, um, there have been some, some videos and some other stories where they, they really tell the story, but they really start from the point where a child finds, the, the, finds the, this lost puffling. It's, it's from the child's point of view, but that misses a lot of the puffling's life. And what I think makes, makes it compelling, you know, Amy, you have the, these sort of cliffhangers. I probably just have one cliffhanger, but I love the fact that, you know, you have this there's a mom and a dad puffin, and it's the same mom and dad every year. The, the same mom and dad meet every year at the same cliff and raise a single baby chick from an egg. Um, they take turns keeping that egg warm for 45 days. I learned, by the way, that they don't actually sit on the egg. They just have a pouch next to their wing. <laughs> Little things I wanted to make, I got as accurate as possible. 45 days till the, the, the chick hatches from the egg, 45 days of feeding it fish, roughly. These are all approximate. And then it's on its own. And I love the arc saying, you know, here's this nice, cozy, warm puffling. He's safe. His mom and dad are both taking care of him. He's in this burrow. He's cozy. And then he's on his own. It's nighttime, right? He goes out, they go out at night uh, because there are some birds that want to eat them for a snack otherwise. So they go out by, by the cover of night. That's why they're looking for the moon. And then they're, they're lost and stuck. And I just love that arc of he's safe and cozy and then he's not at all. And then he's rescued, right? And then there's the heroes of Iceland. That's the, the subtitle, the children who rescue them. So I had to tell her from the Puffling's point of view to make sure you see that whole arc of life is good. 
I even says this page ends with life was good and then it wasn't so good anymore. And so I wanted to tell the story as accurately as I could, given my, my, my puffin was narrating. And so you see, you know, here's the, the mom or the dad bringing fish. And then here's a little boy who he's not real, um, but he's got his little box. You know, the, the, the previous night he coaxed this puffling into his box with a flashlight and hopefully some gentle nudging kept him overnight in his house. I think you don't get much sleep that night if you have this scared, lonely, lost puffling, doesn't know where he is in this box all night. But then the next day, take him to the Sea Life Trust. They weigh them. They make sure they don't have oil on their wings. And then they send him out to the ocean and they're saved. So yeah, I wanted to make sure you knew what the puffin looked like that. I think, you know, this is obviously is a book for kids, right? This is Amy's book it has a lot more words in it. Um, you can see from this, it's really meant for kids, maybe ages between three and seven, but I hear from adults as well. They're reading it to kids, but they're learning something as well, right? Those last couple of pages, I'm giving you facts. And as you go, every adult who's not from Iceland who's read this book said, I learned something as well from this book. And that's really what I was going for. It's really great. How how would somebody purchase your book? Uh, yeah, so um, you can find it on Amazon. Um, let me actually bring that right back up again because I think I have another page about this. Share that. Um, you can get it from Amazon and I have, you can just go to Amazon, your local Amazon and search for, for, for the, the name of the book, Lundi the Lost Puffin or my name. Um, if you want an autographed copy, I just introduced this for the holidays. You want an autograph. Um, I once had an author tell me that she does a book signing and you can either get it autographed or not autographed, signed or unsigned. And the signed ones are a dollar cheaper. <laughs> she actually charges less because she's you know, writing on it, ruining this, this perfect pristine book. So I don't know if people want the autograph copy or not, but if you do, you can go go to my website, isomwithkids.com slash puffin book. Same price either way. Um, one, you get maybe faster shipping, not for me, mine will be slower shipping, but uh, you can order the book. It's nine ninety nine US, uh, different uh, for for different countries. But um, if you get the book from me, the autograph copy. Um, and David, you mentioned that I, I just won this Moonbeam Award, um, a silver medal uh, for best children's ebook. The ebook is the same as the printed book, just electronic. Um, you do get the little the little sticker. Um, on the bottom of, of your book, that's actually a raised embossed sticker. I think the first 25 people get that sticker. So again, if you want the signature on the sticker, you can get it from me. Um, if you can also just go to Amazon and order copies as well. That's, that's great, thanks. Um, I bought the book, I read through it in about 10 minutes. It was fabulous. Um, I gotta say, I like short chapters. I like short children's books with <laughs> great illustrations. And yeah, partly yeah. this book is important to me too, because my great grandmother in 1882 emigrated to North America from Haymay. Wow, really? And her great uncle died while cliff hanging to get puffin eggs. He fell off the cliff. Oh, oh, wow. oh there, There's some family story that kind of makes your book uh, meaningful to me, so thanks. Does your family have experience rescuing pufflings like this? I think I might have some cousins still living there and they must, but I haven't met them, so. Yeah, very cool. Well, we also, we also did, did some cliff swing. I didn't even mention that, but they have Sprengen. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but there's a cliff with a, ro uh, with a, a rope hanging down that you can practice swinging around. Um, and I guess that uh, our tour guide told us that some of the locals go and watch the, 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 the tourists come and sort of bash against this cliff because they don't know how to, how to orient themselves. But you can go, one of the things you can do is actually practice swinging on, on the cliff, which is what they use to, to go and gather eggs. So another piece of history that makes the, the, the Westman Island so wonderful. Amazing. Amy, tell us a little more, if you can, about Laura and maybe how to get your book. I think you've got several great things on your website. Yeah, I can um, I can give you an idea of what I've got. Okay, so here's here's the Laura book, and um, uh, you can get it on my website or from Amazon. Um, my website is mishenspen.com, so it's M S H E N S. P E N, Ms. Hens Pen.com. And um, the other books I think that you were mentioning, they have strong female characters. There's um, actually four stories in two volumes about Lottie Gunderson, girl scientist. She has a scientific mind. And um, so there's Lucky Lottie, Spotty Lottie, Rocky Lottie, and Lakey Lottie. And in each one, there's a little. Um, there's some scientific information that kids can glean through a story about uh, third graders. And that's about the, it's interest level from probably first through fifth grade and uh, about a third grade reading level. So. so what is it about that female empowerment message that you're sending to 
girls as being scientists and rock hunters or whatever those new books are, but also Laura, what, what female message are you sending with through Laura? Well, I really love that she solves her own problems. She's not, um, she's not like a man hater or anything. She does actually get married in the story, but um, she is a, an empowered girl and her father um, gave her some good lessons on how to, how to uh, protect herself and some good wisdom. And uh, she took that with her on her trip. And um, I, I just want girls to know that like every other mother <laughs> wants their girls to know that they can do anything. They can do anything and be anything. Very cool. Yep. And then uh, two of the other books, this one would probably mostly be of interest to people in West Michigan. This is about um, John Ball, who gave the property for um, our zoo and park in Grand Rapids. And um, everybody has climbed on this statue, but they didn't know all the cool things he did. It was like the Forrest Gump of West Michigan. And then um, the other book, I don't know if people are familiar with Mackinac Island, but um, I was asked by the librarians in town to write a book about Mackinac Island. There's a lot of things about Mackinac Island that's, that are published, but they're kind of piecemeal. And could we get everything in one place? So when Eric talks about kind of a travel guide, this has a walking tour and sort of travel tips and uh, some history and some little known facts. And yeah, so it's all fun. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions that have come in from the audience already. So I'd like to kind of stay with you, Amy. Um, I have a really great comment here that says, I guess I asked the question like, why female empowerment stories? Well, the comment is, well, of course, female empowerment stories. We like to see ourselves represented on the page. That's why we like female empowerment stories. I agree. Thank you very much for that comment to a man. I need to hear that. And um, another question, did you set out to write books with female lead characters? Was that intentional from somebody? Um, one of my favorite stories from when I was a kid was Pippi Longstocking. You know, like who couldn't love a girl who lives by herself and can lift a horse with one hand? She could do anything. And I just love that idea. And um, when I was working in the elementary libraries, there were so many stories about, oh, princesses that need to be rescued. And, uh, and I, I just, I, I, I kind of reject that whole uh, genre of children's books in that they really give kids a wrong impression about who they are and who they can be. So I, that's, that's really why I wrote the Lottie Gunderson books. Great. And boys read them too, which is, part of the goal. <laughs> Eric, somebody from our audience asks about your illustrations, saying that the illustrations are amazing. What was the process to bring the story to life through these illustrations? Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, I didn't do any of it. I just chose the person to, 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 to draw them. You know, I realized when I went to do this book, I did most of the work for my travel guidebook myself, right? So I, I paid someone to, to, to do the cover, didn't like it, and then made the cover myself. I paid someone to handle the layout for me, didn't like it, and then ended up doing the layout myself as well. When it came to the illustrations, I knew I couldn't do it. That, is, that isn't my, my forte. Um, I looked at a lot of people's sample work online, uh, people who mostly did animals. I wanted to find someone who could, could sort of capture personality with, within the animals. And I actually ended up um, hiring two different people. Um, I asked them, I, I paid them both money to, I said, uh, make my cover for me. And I'm realizing right now, I actually have a, a painting that a, a woman made, made for me. I didn't end up using her work, but it was a really nice painting of, of a, a puffin. I should probably use that somewhere. Um, but both of, the, both of them made a, a cover for me and I sort of went out to friends and family. Um, let me see if I can sort of quickly you know, show you the, the cover here. You know, showed me this this image, and I just love the love the, the 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 personality he captured, the sort of depth and color. I really feel like I got lucky by finding him. Um, maybe it's a little bit of what I did because I went through you know fifty to hundred different portfolios of people and chose two to actually hire. You know, pay them both to uh, 
to 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 make that cover for me. But um, once I, I I found this illustrator, um, I knew I'd really found someone who was, who was going going to 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 be great. And I just sort of gave him guidance, um, gave him sample pictures. That turned out to be really critical. Is that he sort of left to his own devices, he would make something really cool, but it wouldn't really look like Iceland as much. It would just look like something beautiful, some beautiful shoreline or coastline. And so I learned that um, I went online and I, again, gave him this portfolio, probably over a hundred different images. So when I said, okay, for this page, I want to have, you know, puffin flying over a cliff. Here are five pictures of cliffs from Iceland. Um, and that really gave me, made his, his work was amazing, but then it gave it that, that sort of accuracy that actually looked like Iceland. I think that sort of working with that. So one, sorting through a lot of people and finding the right person. And then two, letting him, letting him do his thing after I gave him the guidance, here's what I want. Here's a dozen different sort of stock images, if you will, reference images, I think made his work much, much better. I'm sure his name is in your book, but what is this great illustrator's name? Um, yeah, his he goes by. I can, it is in the inside of the book. He goes by Kronos Mond. That's what what he likes to, to do. And I can put a link up there. But yeah, in the book, um, K R O N O S M O N D. Um, he's international from Indonesia, I think. And so um, oh. you can find him online. And um, yeah, he was very reasonable to work with, and he was he was great. Highly recommended. Now, two rather practical questions came through. I think I'll kind of merge them together. The first is. Uh, have either of the authors studied the Icelandic language in any depth? And do the authors get more money from the book by buying direct versus <laughs> Amazon? Those are good questions. <laughs> you want me to take it? Sure. OK. So um, the, the Lara book has some Icelandic words in it. The names are all authentic. Icelandic names. I actually even research what do the names mean because I wanted the characters to have names that meant what I intended them to be like. And um, so, you know, use the Icelandic words for mother and father and brother and uh, a lot of the place names and a few of the expressions that they used. But I didn't, I, I haven't studied the language like in depth. Um, I'm in three different writing groups, and um, when I brought it to the one writing group, that their suggestion, and this was very early on, was to incorporate more of the languages, both um, both Icelandic and Norwegian, in the in the book. They're easy to figure out what they mean. And uh, yes, you get like pennies from. Uh, Amazon. So if you'd like to order a copy, I'd love it if you um, ordered it off the website, you'll get it directly from me and I'll sign it for you. I'll sign All them. All right. All right. So we can, we can get signed copies of both books tonight by going to their personal yeah. websites. Love it. Yeah. Eric, you want to try those two questions about the language? Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. I also, unfortunately, haven't studied Icelandic very much, other than to make sure I'm saying things roughly close to to, to correct. Um, I actually just launched a, a podcast, um, which I'd pushed off for many, many years because I couldn't say the names of the towns and the names of the waterfalls. And so I'm learning how to make sure that I sound like I speak Icelandic, but I, I definitely do not. Um, Lundi does mean puffin. And so actually somebody who speaks Icelandic might think that Lundi the lost puffin is actually puffin the lost puffin. So I don't know, you can tell I'm not really, I don't even know how that sounds in Icelandic. Um, as for uh, sort of book economics, um, I do maybe a little bit better than Amy does on Amazon. My, my book is much, much shorter and Amazon does sort of charge printing per page. Um, and so I do a little bit better if you buy it uh, directly from me. Uh, but if you buy it from Amazon, it gives me a sale on Amazon and Amazon may rank it higher, which may mean somebody else buys the book. So it, it's kind of a wash. If you want it autographed and stickered, you can get it from me if you want to the convenience of Amazon, uh, for my book at least. Sounds like maybe not for Amy. Amy <laughs> gives all her money to Amazon, but uh, I get roughly the same either way. It's a little bit more if you buy it from me though. Okay. There's two more questions in the queue, uh, basically in Amy's direction. You mentioned writing Laura of the North in a way that would appeal to a younger audience. And you've been a school librarian. The question is, would this book or could this book be incorporated somehow into some kind of school curriculum? Um, if somebody wanted to study history, you know, it's, it's definitely historical fiction. I, 
did a lot of research to make sure that everything that I put in there was as accurate as possible. Um, so if, you, if someone wanted to study Scandinavian culture and history and pandemic, <laughs> uh, it certainly could be. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Do you plan to go back to Iceland? and maybe perhaps do research for another book? Is there another story around the drowning pool perhaps? I have so much research. I could do like a prequel and two sequels. I don't know if I have it in me. It took me like three years really to write this book. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask so, you what some of the challenges are being an author um, and publishing in time, I guess is one big challenge. Yeah, and I kind of got hung up on doing research, which, you know, explains the big bin of materials. Um, and finally, there's, there's a thing called NaNoWriMo. And uh, Eric is probably familiar with us. Uh, it's National Novel Writing Month. It's no, in November every year. And so in 2019, after I went to, on the trip from the Faroe Islands to Iceland and back, um, I uh, joined on with NaNoWriMo. I thought I've got to at least get a draft done. I've got to get it. So I wrote every day, all day for the entire month of November. And I had written parts of it prior to that, but um, I, I just felt like I had to like, okay, quit it already, start writing. And, um, and so then I was able to get, you know, the draft done, but I actually didn't have a, a, book to hold in my hand until May of the following year because you know you do drafts and you do proofreading and you do you know layouts and yeah it's it's a process but my daughter's a graphic designer and she designed the cover <laughs> and actually a picture I took in Iceland and then she found this picture of this girl and put her on there which I thought turned out pretty cool. Very nice. Yeah. Well, we're about at the end of our question queue and we're about at that 45 minute mark. So do either of you have some last minute thoughts and then we'll wrap up. Hmm. Last minute thoughts. I'll just say thank you for hosting this. I think it's great. So, you know, this is, I, I watched your other uh, webinar as well with the other I Icelandic author. And I think it's just wonderful to sort of showcase uh, these, these books that are, are being written about Iceland. I think uh, it's, it's wonderful to sort of see, and they're all very, very different books. And so it's, it's yeah. really wonderful to see all of the, the, all of the different people who are taking different angles about writing about Icelandic, Icelandic history and culture. So thank you for highlighting these. Yes. Yeah. And you know, if you want to help uh, an author, one way to do that is to leave a review on Amazon. You don't have to buy the book from Amazon in order to leave a review. And um, every review is helpful because it helps to boost you up in the search engine. Um, and so, yeah, I would encourage you to do that, not just for Eric and me, but for any, any author. Thank you, Absolutely. good advice for the reader. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank you both for investing your time writing these books, making us uh, aware of their presence. And I hope lots of us will go out and buy these as Christmas gifts. I also want to thank our members of the audience uh, for being here and reminding you that the uh, information about their businesses can be found on the INL US website. Also, today's recording of this webinar will be available in a couple of days on our website along with many of the other webinars that we've had this year. We've had scholars, musicians, authors, um, lots of really, a chef, a chef photographer a couple of months ago that was a really great combination. You know, she prepares great food and teaches us how to take pictures of it. Anyway, there's some good stuff out there. We want to keep bringing good programming to you, especially in times when we're not able to go to the theater or the football games, you know. So keep supporting us with your membership through 2021. That would be great. And thank you both for being here today. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>